Hey everybody, it's Stephanie from thirdgradethoughts.com and I am coming to you with part two of Getting It Started Math Rotations. This is all about planning and grouping your students and this is something you're going to be doing th many times throughout the course of the year. So even if you're coming to this video and it's the middle of the school year, definitely look through this and don't feel um, nervous about getting it started in the middle of the year because that's what I did last year and it worked great. So the first thing you're going to want to do as you start each new unit is a pre-assessment. And I don't mean the entire end of unit assessment at the beginning because um, if you're just like me, you just don't have time for that. So um, what I usually do is I'll look at that end of unit test and I'll only pull about five to seven questions. I usually will either retype the questions or I will literally like get scissors and cut them out and tape them onto a new sheet of paper to make copies. They don't have to be pretty. They're not going home. They're just one point of reference for me and I really just need to keep it easy for me. I'll give this pre-assessment and then I'll grade it that afternoon after the kids have gone home and then put them into their groups so uh, that way we're ready to go for the next day. So it needs to be kind of quick and, and easy um, but also give you some good reference points. I split my kids based on that assessment into three groups, low, medium, high. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the group makeup here in a bit, but I really want to try to keep um, these groups as balanced as possible. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that you want to be considering um, the reading level of some of your kids, uh, because especially with the new Common Core, um, there's a lot more problem solving and a lot more reading in math than at least my previous programs have used. And so that's just, again, another point of reference to consider. This is the group's uh, planning page, and this is included in that planning packet um, that you'll be able to find on my blog post. And so all I do is just do the unit, the dates that it'll be running, the standards we're going to hit from Common Core, and then there are three boxes because I do three rotations, HML standing for high, medium, low, and um, then I'm just going to list the students. The color, the circle on the right-hand side is um, where I'm just going to put a color. I organize my groups by colors, red, blue, green green, yellow, it doesn't really matter, any three colors that you'd like. And the reason I do that is because I obviously don't want my kids to know um, whether they're high, medium, low. And I also will mix the colors up a lot throughout the year. So that way the kids don't get too hung up on, oh, you know, I'm in the red group, I'm in the red group all year long, right? I really just try to keep it, keep it really fluid and very flexible. Um, when you do the grouping, the easiest way to tell the kids about the grouping is using bookmarks. And if you've read my blog, you know that I love these bookmarks. There's a tutorial um, for how to make them using full-size PDFs and shrinking them down. And you can do this in several ways. If you have my Chevron packet of math rotations, you can actually make, um, like choose all the purple chevron for the purple group and, and list it, you know, by the order that they'll be doing it. So, you know, teacher time, lesson work, math centers. Um, and then the green group can be math centers, teacher time, lesson work. And then the orange chevron could be lesson work, um, math centers, teacher time, right? So you can, you can do one color chevron for each group. And that would be like, you're the orange group. Here's your orange chevron bookmark. You could also mount your bookmarks on different colored construction paper, and I have a picture of that coming up. I did that for Daily 5 last year for a little bit. And then the the strategy that I ended up using and I found the most helpful were using those vis -vis markers. Um, I have a whole bunch of them left over from the days of overhead, and we don't have overhead projectors anymore, so I actually found these to be great. I would um, just do my regular old bookmarks, then that way I could reuse them the entire year and really be able to switch up colors and all that good stuff. And then I would just grab three colors of my VCB markers and those would be the colors of my groups. And then as I told kids what group they would be in for that unit, I would just write their name on the bookmark in that color of VCB. And so that served two purposes. A, the kids knew what color their group was. And then B, if they ever misplaced their bookmark, which as you know with some kids happens a lot, um, then other kids in the class could be like, oh, this bookmark belongs to so-and-so and get it back to them. So that was great. So there weren't any stray bookmarks just left around and kids didn't know you know where they belonged <laughs> Our new math program, Math Expressions, I was just at a training this week, um, uses shapes for the different levels, circle, square, triangle. Um, I think that's another way you can group, um, you know, besides being the, the color coded, but um, I'm not going to do that this year, but there are obviously other grouping strategies, so I just threw that one in there. I try to keep six to eight students in each group, and obviously that really depends on the size of your class. I had, um, you know, if you usually have about 25 kids, um, I really try to keep my smallest group 
my lowest group and that, you know, the, these are my strugglers. These are the kids that really require a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention. I don't mind that my middle group is my biggest group and it typically is. Um, and then my highest group really needs to be my most independent group um, because they're going to be working on things that are going to be higher level thinking, um, you know, more math puzzles, math riddles, all of that good stuff. And so if, you know, there's somebody who's, you know, incredibly highly distractible or just a gigantic behavior problem, um, that may or may not work for them. And you may just want to give it a try and then, you know, feel free to move them around as you see fit. Oftentimes though, some behavior problems will get solved when they're in a really independent group and, and have some challenges in front of them. So again, just, just a balancing act, as you guys know, that's what our job is best at. Here are the examples of the math rotations. The one on the top left corner is what I end up using, um, that each center is a different color. And then with their vis-a-vis -vis marker, I'll just put their name somewhere on the side or, or wherever the case may be. Um, below that, you'll see the red, yellow, green, and blue bookmarks. That's the example of if you wanted to just glue them down to, to make them a little bit sturdier and laminate them. I did that for daily five, and that was pretty easy. Um, just to say, hey, my blue kids, I need to see you back here. And then everyone with a blue bookmark could go back and see me. And then on the right-hand side is the image that um, will hopefully tip you off. If you are unsure about how to make these bookmarks, if this is something that you're interested in, there's a link in my math rotations packet, um, but there's also this direct link on my blog. So even if you go to my blog and search bookmarks, uh, you'll be able to, to pull that up, and it's a really easy tutorial. Once you have your three groups, again, lowest, trying to make your smallest group, uh, your medium group, probably your biggest, and then your high group, you know, medium size, <laughs> um, then what I like to do is I like to do my whole week at a glance. I try not to go past a week at a glance um, and plan the entire unit out in advance because, as you guys know, just things come up, and especially with Common Core, you know, there, there are some gaps with the jump. Um, and, you know, so I just like to do one week at a time, and that's just a personal thing. So that's why I included a weekly planner and a daily planner. Um, after I have my week at a glance, and I really take it down and I break it down day by day, um, to make sure that we're all going to be, you know, on the on the same page at the same time. Always looking for differentiation options up and down, both in our math program, um, other resources I have. Obviously, Teachers Pay Teachers is a wonderful resource. And then we do this Monday through Thursday. So our rotations go through, you know, every 18 minutes um, during our 60-minute math block, Monday through Thursday. So Friday is sort of a catch-up or catch-all day. And the kids come in, and there's one rotation of 18 minutes. And then after that, we do a whole group game or activity. So for that first 18 minutes, my lower kids, my lowest group, come straight to me just like they always do for teacher time, except for instead of a new lesson, what I'm doing is I'm hitting any of the um, points that we really struggled on for that week. So I'm going back and we may be reviewing something from Tuesday that, that they may have struggled with, or we could just be doing a cumulative review of Monday through Thursday's work, um, anything like that. You know, maybe just some more hands-on manipulative work, all that good stuff. My medium kids are going to be coming in and they're going to be working on math centers or fact practice, although typically they're just working on math centers. And then my high kids are going to be coming in and they're going to be doing the lesson work from Thursday's teacher time. Because remember, my high kids end the day with me in teacher time. And so Friday they come in, they've only had to retain that information for one evening and into the next day. And um, and that way I'm not you know requiring them to memorize it for the whole weekend, right? Um, and then like I said, there's a whole group game or activity. We'll play Scoot, we'll do Monster Math, we'll do Bingo, you know, we just do fun things. Um, um, you know, whatever the case may be for the rest of that time on Friday. So a great question that pops up is, well, what do the high kids do on Monday when they come in? And I actually really like this time. Um, there are always, always, always great enrichment activities that are provided in the programs that we have that I'm never able to get to because there's just no time. And so what I love then is lesson work on Monday is like the, my high kids enrichment time. So that means that they could be working on some of those math riddles or math puzzles. Um, a lot of that higher level thinking, um, problem solving stuff, you know, that really challenges them. Um, some of my high kids can come in and get started with that right away. And some of my other high kids may need to partner up. But again, I'm requiring them to be the most independent in my group. So I, I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm kind of honoring that in them that, you know, you guys need to get started with this. And, um, and it's very fun. And then when we meet for teacher time, I can either, you know, at the end of that math rotations on Monday, I can either collect that or we can talk about it. Um, or they may need to just hold on to it and work on it that next Monday or continue to work on 
on it as they get done with lesson work. So it's just kind of a fun way to sort of launch the week with some higher level thinking strategies for them. Um, if you don't have access to those kinds of enrichment activities, that's okay. Especially at the beginning of the year when we're just getting things started, I will oftentimes put my high kids, I'll give them some technology time on that first rotation on Monday, and they can log into ScootPad, and that is all self-differentiating, um, and it hits the Common Core standards. So I don't feel bad having them do an extra session of technology because they typically don't get a lot of time to do that. Um, and so they will use that 18 minutes to be on ScootPad, and again, just kind of going deeper with some of the Common Core standards. And like I said, it, it differentiates for them, so then that makes it easy for me. Here are the plans. They're on the left-hand side of the weekly plans, right-hand side of the daily plans. Um, the weekly plans come broken up, low, medium, high, um, on for teacher time and lesson work. And then if you can see down below that second one, it's just an open block. So really depending you know, on how you want to do it. For teacher time, I do teach the same lesson three times. And so just know that, that I'm not just saying one lesson um, or I'm also not switching the lessons. Obviously, I'll differentiate up and down, but we are learning the same, you know, lesson 1.3 or whatever, you know, on the same day because I need to, you know, stick with what my district requires of me. And so, um, so you know, I'm not teaching addition to one group and division to another group and probability to a third group. You know, that's not happening. Um, where the differentiation really comes in is our use of manipulatives during teacher time or the, um, you know, the, the discussions that I'm having during teacher time. And then obviously then during lesson work, um, low kids may, you know, be allowed to continue to use manipulatives during um, lesson work time, um, or they may be able to work with a partner, you know, to, to bounce questions off of. My high kids may have some higher level, um, you know, descriptions or, or you know, um, explanations that they'll need to include for every single problem, whereas my middle kids may only have to do that for one problem, you know. So that's really where the, where the differentiated work comes in. On the daily side over here, you'll see there's the unit, the dates, the standards, the same thing as before, my low, medium, high, coloring in the dot just so I can stay on top of it, listing the students. And then you can see on the bottom um, the rotations that the kids will be going in. So I typically, reading from left to right, that first column is low, the middle column is medium, and the right column is high. And that's the that's the rotations that they go in. So I see my low kids right off the bat, then they go to lesson work, then they go to math centers. Again, 18 minutes for each. So that way I can just sort of plug it in there. I don't do the daily every single day, um, but it's also really, really nice to use if you have a sub in the room. So that way it's just one, uh, one big snapshot of what math centers looks like. Um, always be assessing along the way. Uh, I can't ugh, can't emphasize that enough. There have definitely been times when that pre-assessment has told me some information, but not all the information, and I have had to switch kids from groups. Um, if a if a medium kiddo just ends up bombing lesson after lesson, I'm like, you know, this is not doing us any favors, and so I'll just move him down to the lower group. Obviously, never telling him that, but just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to switch you to the yellow group tomorrow. You're going to meet with me right off the bat for teacher time, and you know, and all as well. Um, and then. And same thing, I've had uh, kiddos in the medium group that have just soared, and I'm like, I can't keep you in this medium group, you got to move up to the high group. And again, same thing, I just say, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to have you um, meet with me at the, very end of, uh, the, at the very end of math rotations, you know, let me just switch your bookmark, or all that good stuff. So it really is not that big of a deal, and um, but, but it is important that you feel the freedom that you can do that, and it's an important thing to do. Always be looking at their lesson work, their homework, um, depending on how much you do that, and then their teacher time responses. It's so much easier, so much easier in a group of six, eight, ten kids than it is with 25, 30 kids. So um, so it will be easier than, than whole class just to, to be assessing along the way. Um, please remember to pre-assess before each unit. I didn't one unit last year, and it just was a disaster, and it was all my fault, and I should have known better. <laughs> um, but speaking from experience, always remember to pre-assess and keep it easy for you, but still pre-assess because kids will move groups and and that it just was such a bad unit that I did last year. Um, as the year progresses, as the kids get more used to the structure of math rotations, mix up who you meet with first, meaning you don't always have to meet with your low kids. Um, I do at the beginning of the year because they're, you know, math rotations is new. Um, 
But as they, you know, are more confident and, and as the kids really get into the routine of it, then maybe meet with your middle kids first or maybe meet with your middle kids last. And then they're the ones that are responsible for sort of, you know, retaining that knowledge into lesson work at the start of the next day. You guys will get to know your kids and you'll know, you know, what's, what's going to be doable and not. I typically do always meet with my highest kids last, um, but I will switch my low and mediums. Um, but I also just did it, you know, for, I didn't do it for the entire year last year. So maybe it'll be different this year. So. Uh, it does get easier, and that's the main thing that I can just tell you, that you really should, can just trust the process and know that at the beginning of the year it's hard because it's new for you, it's new for the kids. The kids are new in your classroom anyway, and so there's a lot of growing pains, but it does get easier, and the payoff is great. Um, kids love math. You love teaching it more, um, and you really, for me, I just found myself being so much more purposeful and focused in my instruction, and, um, and there was so much more interaction, and uh, it just... It worked. It was such a great thing. I did include some sticky note observations. I have a couple blog posts about these. Um, I've used them before in reading conferences, so I just included these here for math conferences. I do not do this every day with every kid, but I will just do name, date, skill, observations, and next steps. Uh, the next steps are important for me, um, especially you know as, as we're getting toward the end of a unit or if I really see a kid struggling, it really is just like, okay, what do I need to do differently, especially with my low kids for that Friday meeting time. Um, so again, just, just a nice little template for you to use and uh, there we go. So if you want any more information on math rotations, I, you know me, I'll continue to post things as the year goes on, um, but there is a tab at the top of my blog, and if there's any questions, leave them below in the comments, and I will do my very best to try to answer them. If not, write in the comments, then know that I'm reading them and keeping them in mind when I do um, you know, my next post. So uh, you can always find me at thirdgradethoughts.com, and thank you guys so much for hanging out with me, and good luck with math rotations this year. Take care.